everybody got another review for you world war ii action again uh, this time we got panzer grenadier deluxe tactical world war ii rules uh, now this is by the author of the general to brigade rule system napoleonic rules so it's along that same line of rules that's by david brown uh let's take a look at it first of all it's a hardback which is really nice and it's got about, let's see, there's 242 plus pages. Uh, these last pages here are all play sheets and stuff that you can photocopy. Full color, look at that. So yeah, there's an impetus track, unit orders, markers, they got a template here, and so on. And these are gloss pages, full color throughout, as you can see here. Uh, there's lots of photographs, World War II action going on. And... There is, in fact, lots of pictures of miniatures, full color. Uh, so the production quality is very high. These are pretty thick pages. I'm not going to tear on you. Uh, one nice feature is it's got this nice little uh, ribbon here in the center of the book. So is that classy or what? I love it. Uh, so you don't lose your page when you're reading the rules. I don't see many rules that include these kind of things. Uh, so it's nice to see. So there you go. It's got one of those, folks. Uh, again, this is World War II. Set of tactical set of rules. Uh, we got a nice little introduction going on there. Uh, this is, by the way, the deluxe edition, which I should point out, which is basically a third edition of the rules. This set of rules has been around three editions now. Uh, and it has changed. It has come a long way, actually. It's, it's a much smoother game, uh, streamlined, uh, than the previous editions. Uh, definitely an improvement in the rules. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's skip past this, get into the index, and check out what is in this set of rules. First thing we're going to get into here is the chapter one, which is all about scales, bases, and dice that you need in the game. Now, like most of the General's Brigade system, you only need basically two or three D6, and you're good to go. Uh, most of the, ro the rolls that you make in this game are with a 2d6 against the target number, and there'll be modifiers on that die roll. Uh, sometimes you do only make a single d6 roll, and that's about it. So it's not a really dice-heavy game. You're not going to be rolling bucket loads of dice with this set of rolls. Uh, and the scale of the figures is basically, there's two scales you can play this game with, all right? Uh, figure scale. There's the first scale, which is the primary scale the rules are designed around, which is infantry models represent two to four men each, uh, and a base would equal a section or a squad. Uh, your vehicles, your AFVs, equal two or three actual vehicles. Uh, so one model is basically a section or a troop of uh, vehicles. Uh, and finally, one gun model is two to three guns in representation, which is basically a gun section. Uh, that's the main scale that this set of rules is built around. Uh, your basic units of maneuver will be infantry platoons, tank platoons, uh, <clears throat> made up of like four vehicles or four <clears throat> bases of infantry, excuse me, uh, and so on. So this is a battalion level game, really. That's pretty much what it's designed around. Uh, but there is an alternate basing system that is more in line with the one-to-one -one scale, like Flames of War and Battle Group, where one model equals one model, and that's how it works. So you're going to have tank platoons represented by five or six models, uh, and squads of infantry represented by literally uh, eight to twelve miniature figures. Uh, so there is a section here called Figure Scale 2 that you can play the game that way on a one-to-one -one scale. And there's some rules adjustments to allow that. Uh, another thing is that there is a basing system specific for these rolls. Uh, basically one-inch square bases with three or two figures on them. It's, it's basically a suggestion. It's not essential. In fact, the basing is irrelevant in this game. You can use figures that are based individually, mounted for flames of war, or using the suggestions here. In fact, there is a section in here that mentions using figures mounted for flames of war. Uh, as you can see here, some of the pictures, for instance, show just that. Got some figures based very similar to Flames of War, uh, and so on. So you don't have to worry about your basing. You could use these figures with your collection uh, of models, uh, whether they're based for I Ain't Been Shot Mom or Flames of War or Battle Group. It doesn't matter. Uh, one other thing is the rules are designed for any scale figures, uh, 15 millimeter, 20 millimeter. You can use these rules with 25 mil uh, or smaller, like 10 mil or micro scale. 
I use 15 millimeter with this, and that's ideal for me. Uh, and the rules uh, mentioned using 15 mil and 20 mil specifically, but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't use bigger scales. In fact, it talks about using bigger size miniatures or smaller with your games. So that's the basing, and that's the figure scale of the game. So now let's get into chapter two, which is all about how your armies are Section. organized. It's all about how your armies are organized now. Keep in mind that it's basically a battalion level game. You're going to have multi companies going at it in these battles that you're going to fight. And, but it's not called a battalion, it's called a battle group. And basically, you will have a number of company commanders uh, in charge of a bunch of platoons of infantry and tanks. And uh, it's basically the equivalent of a double, two companies, three companies, or larger uh, action. You can play with company level games if you wanted to, and especially if you use the one to one basing system. Uh, you would easily be able to handle company level actions. Uh, but this is pretty much what a typical army would look like, where you've got a bunch of tanks and quite a few infantry. And the number of tanks and bases of infantry that you have determines how many company commanders you have. Now, it's very abstract the way it represents company commanders and uh, the battle group commander. Uh, it's basically based on the number of units of infantry and tanks that you have in your force. That determines how many company commanders you will field. Uh, in general, it's about every 15 bases or vehicles will give you a, a company commander. But that could be different based on nationality and time. It might be a good idea to take a look at this little example here, because this, this pretty much shows you uh, what a basic army will look like. And basically, you have all these rifle sections with their transport and a platoon command. This would be a platoon right here. You got one, two, three sections. Uh, down here, we got the second platoon with its command base, a light machine gun section, which is basically like rifles, except they have uh, an LMG. Then you got two more rifle sections, and then a third platoon of infantry with, again, an LMG section and two rifle sections. And finally, down here, another platoon command, which includes uh, some anti tank and support weapons, like a medium machine gun, an anti tank weapon, uh, etc., and some transport. And on top of this, you have some Stuarts uh, and some recon vehicles, Churchill tanks, uh, with a platoon command as well. So basically, we have one, two, three, four, five platoons uh, with some recon ability, and the rest is just command. Now, you have your headquarters command, which is the battle group command. If your player has one of these, <clears throat> you get that automatically. Uh, that's your headquarters. That's basically you on the table. And in this case, because there's about 15 or so of these uh, units, it gets one company headquarters base. Uh, and that's what that is. And this is basically an extension in, as far as command is concerned, of your headquarters. So you want to spread them around so you can control more units. Uh, and finally, an artillery observer. Uh, and that's a basic small army, uh, moderate-sized army. But there you go. That's an example of how or what an army will look like in this game. Let's see what's next in this. Now, the next few pages are going to talk about the specific troop types, like the headquarters, the company headquarters, the battle group headquarters, multiplayer games. It talks about this. Here's an important chart that's worth mentioning. Uh, this is basically the number of company HQ bases uh, that you get for every section you have in your army. Now, this doesn't include transport vehicles, but it does include vehicles as well as infantry sections. So, for instance, uh, the Germans of 1939 to 42 do get one company HQ per 12 sections. Now that's that's quite versatile. That's a lot of company HQ. And like I said, the company HQs in this game are very important because they they represent your influence on the battlefield. The more of them you have, the more troops you can keep activated and doing things uh, and use your impetus, as I'll get into later, uh, during the game. And again, here we are talking about multiplayer games. Uh, the next sections talk about the various troop types, infantry, tanks, and guns, and how they're represented on the battlefield. Uh, you got your rifle sections, LMG sections, and so on and so forth. Everything you'd expect. Uh, Flamethrowers, anti-tank teams, heavy weapon teams like... Uh, heavy machine guns and MG42s set up on tripods, for instance, uh, how they're represented in the game. Talks about artillery, talks about cavalry. Uh, and then we get into the troop quality. Now, there, I believe there's five, one, two, three, four, five different qualities of troops in this game, and two subcategories, uh, which can also define a troop type. So you could have regular troops, who are, in this case, 
aggressive. Uh, these are the subtypes, aggressive and battle-hardened. Uh, and these are the five basic troop types, elites, veteran, regular, inexperienced militia. These are your morale grades and training grades in the game, basically. Uh, and like I said, there's two subcategories that troops can be uh, divided up into. And then we're going into the battle preparation. These are all the steps to follow before you begin turn one of the game. So it tells you how many uh, uh, company headquarters you get, how to organize your army, all this stuff. The step-by-step -step procedure you follow before you start turn one. Uh, like, for instance, the first thing you do is you establish the battle group composition and troop qualities. Next, determine the number of company HQs. And so on, right down to the 10th part, which is begin turn one. So that's what this section, Chapter 3, is all about, preparing for your battle. Let's take a look. Battle preparation. Now, the first thing it does is it gives you a 10-step sequence here to follow to set up your battle. It starts off with establishing the battle group composition and troop quality. Now, again, the battle group is a term used to describe your army, basically, which is a battalion-sized organization, although it can be smaller. Uh, and then it goes through the 10 steps before you get into turn one of the game. And uh, that's what this chapter goes into. How to uh, determine the number of uh, company HQs, the break point of the armies, which uh, we'll get into later. Uh, Off-board artillery missions, the terrain that you're going to be using in the game, uh, as well as concealed deployment. Uh, you can have concealed units de uh, deployed for the defender and the attacker as well. Uh, there is an advanced rule here where the attacker will use Fog of War cards, and I won't go into details about this, but it's enough to know that this game does make use of hidden deployment and hidden movement. Uh, you don't have to use them, in my opinion, especially if you're playing solo. It may or may not be useful for you to use this section on hidden troops, but it does normally have it as part of the game system, and it tells you how to spot them and, and reveal those hidden units on the tabletop. It talks about deploying your forces and so on and so forth. Uh, and then we get into the meat of the game. Now, this is the game turn, chapter four, and this describes the sequence of the chapter four, and this is a lot of the meat of the game is right here. Now, it's not an I go, you go system, like Flames of War, for instance, but it, it's more like, well, like it says here, it's a we both go type of system, which I like. I like that term. Uh, it's basically a turn is made up of four phases. You've got the headquarters, impetus, and initiative phase, followed by the command phase, and then followed by the exploit phase, and finally the morale phase. Let me zoom in so you can see what I'm talking about here. So you can see all four phases right there. And that's a turn. Uh, looking at them, we got the first phase, which is the headquarters impetus and initiative phase. This is where we determine which side goes first. Uh, both sides roll d6, maybe add some modifiers for their command abilities that they're represented by their force that they represent. Uh, and the highest roll wins initiative. The side with initiative gets to decide who will go first in the upcoming command phase. Uh, in addition, the side that wins initiative also gains the exploit phase. As it says here, winner of the initiative only. Um, we'll get into that in a second. But uh, once we know who has won initiative, uh, both players add to their rolled totals the number of company headquarters they have in their force. And that gives them their impetus value for the turn. And impetus is used to help you activate units during the game. During, in this game, uh, in order to do anything with a unit or a combat group, as it's called, which are the equivalent of like platoon-sized groups, no more than six stands or squads, uh, you have to make an activation roll. And basically, you need a seven or greater uh, to activate them. In other words, to do anything with them. And you only get that one chance. You basically roll 2d6, apply modifiers, and boom. Now, if you roll a four or less... Uh, there's a command confusion. You cannot activate the unit, and you cannot change that result. However, if you roll a 5 or 6, a modified 5 or 6, you can add impetus to it, uh, up to two points of impetus, to turn it into a 7, which allows activation. So it, that's how impetus is used in this game. It, you can add up to two points of it to make your die roll a 7 uh, to be a successful activation. 
Otherwise, you fail and you cannot do anything with that unit. So impetus is an important concept to these rules. In fact, these rules are emphasize command and control, and it's through impetus that it reflects that. And we'll get into that more later on in the video. Uh, but after this, we cut into the second phase, which is the command phase. Now again, the side winning initiative determines who will go first in the command phase. And the side going first is termed the phasing player. Uh, basically, the phasing player will activate his units one at a time. Uh, and if successful, he's allowed to do up things like move and move and fire or uh, just fire or close combat or rapid advance, all kinds of nifty little things that he could do with the unit. The opposing player can react to his movements. Uh, note I said movement. Uh, if the opposing player has a unit and the active player moves a unit in his line of sight, he's allowed to react to it. And to do so usually requires that reacting unit to also activate, again, 7+. Plus. And he could use the impetus to help that in a similar way to the active player. And that allows him to either fall back or to shoot at the opposing unit that's in front of him that's moving. So that's how that works, and it's pretty fun. Uh, once the phasing player is done, the player switch roles, and the non-phasing player does the same thing. He starts activating his units, even if they shot as a reaction in the opposing player's uh, command phase. They can still take actions during their command phase, just as normal. And the opposing player, the previous phasing player, is now reacting to his moves. And that's how the game works, basically. That's the meat of it right there. That's where units shoot, fight in close combats, um, activate, and carry out their activities. And this is where impetus plays a big role. It's, it's during your command phase that you use impetus to help activate your units, or call in airstrikes, or call in... Uh, off table, fire, that kind of thing. Uh, bring on reserve units and so on and so forth. That's what the command phase is all about and use impetus to help you do those things. Uh, so if you don't have much impetus in a turn, it's gonna be tough. Uh, but if you got lots, you can do a lot of things. So that's how it works. Finally, we get to phase three. Well, not finally, there's one more phase after this. But the third phase is the exploit phase. And this is something, again, only available to the side that won initiative. Not the side going first. There's nothing to do with that. The side that won initiative uh, during phase one gets the exploit phase. And it basically allows his side uh, to activate freely a, a certain number of units or command groups. Again, up to six separate units as a command group can activate and carry out a move or a fallback or things of that nature. It just it gives them that little extra bonus movement. And the opponent cannot react uh, to those movements. He can't uh, defensive fire or anything like that. So it's a little bonus that he gets. The number of units that he can do this with is equal to the number of uh, HQ units in his army. That's uh, company command units and his uh, battle group command unit, which both sides always have. Uh, that determines how many they can actually take action with. And finally, we get to the final phase, which is the fourth phase, the morale phase. This is where both sides uh, have an opportunity to rally uh, units that are suppressed, uh, as well as uh, take morale tests for your battle group. Once you've taken 25% losses in units, you're going to have to start making a break test for your side. Uh, and this is where that would be done. And eventually, it could result in part of your army falling back off the table. It could result in your H H battle group HQ being sacked. Or it could result in you just giving up the battlefield entirely. So that happens as soon as your side starts taking, has reached 25% losses. Uh, and that happens after the rally portion of the morale phase. Uh, a side that takes 50% losses automatically loses the battle. That's important to know. There would be no test for that. Uh, so, But once you reach 25% units lost, you've got to start making the break test. And that occurs during the morale phase. So that's the sequence. That's the four phases of the game. Uh, I like it a lot. Uh, it's, it's different, and it's got a lot of action and reaction going on. 
one thing to take note about this is that because both players become phasing players and reacting players, it basically means units can fire more than once. They could fire during their their uh, command phase, and they can also fire as, during the opponent's uh, command phase as a reaction. So it's kind of like you always have two turns to fire, for instance, which I like. It's pretty cool. Uh, so that's the game turn in a nutshell. At this point, we're going to actually get into the mechanics of the game. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail. I'll kind of give you a little overview of how the shooting and the close combat works. Just a rough overview of it all. Uh, after the game turn, in chapter 4, and again, this chapter here really describes in detail how the each phase of the turn works. Uh, breaking down each phase. It then goes into chapter 5, which is all about impetus and so on and so forth. Uh, the command phase, how it's done, the basics of it. Uh, and then it goes into how you activate platoons and combat groups. Uh, and basically, when you do activate them, there's like five, I believe, different orders you can give them, which last the entire combat phase for your side. And it's basically things like... Uh, they can do fire. They can do a tactical move. They could do a tactical move and fire. They could also do a tactical move and recon or fall back. There's also a rapid advance, which is kind of like moving uh, double time uh, if you're playing other games. There's a rally order. There's a withdrawal where you pull your troops back. Uh, there's an option to give an order of coordinated infantry assault. Uh, which basically allows you to activate more than one group of uh, troops, like platoons or combat groups, and uh, close combat with more troops. So that's what that order does. There's also a human wave. Uh, now this costs one extra impetus when you do choose to use this order, and you do want to activate them successfully, you have to pay an extra HQ impetus point to even do this order. And it's the same thing with the coordinated infantry assault. They demand more from your command resources, basically. Uh, so then it goes into the actual spotting and reconnaissance, because remember, this set of rules does use hidden deployment and hidden movement, so you have to acquire your targets uh, and spot them and see what they are and get them revealed on the table. Here's a section that talks about the distances uh, that you can actually acquire targets. I mean, maybe you can shoot across the table, but if they're too far away to see, uh, you can't really target them and shoot them. And that's what this little table is all about. Maximum target acquisition distances. Uh, for instance, you'd look up the spotter type, infantry, AFV, or gun, and the target is infantry or small guns. If they're in cover, it's 18 inches. If they're in the open, it's 24. If the target is an AFV, gun, or vehicle, uh, it's 36 inches if the target is in cover, 48 if it's in the open. So this is the distances you can acquire them, which means that's how far away... Uh, you can shoot a target of that type. And it goes into more detail about that. And there's a reconnaissance, of course, where you can recon areas which you suspect enemy to be located. Uh, and then it goes into movement. And I believe after that it talks about terrain, uh, movement effects of terrain, and cover. It defines it and so on and so forth. Uh, and then I believe it goes into shooting in chapter 10. You got your direct fire. Uh, let's see here. It kind of talks about arcs of fire, the range. Um, describes the different weapon types that each base or stand of troops represents, like rifle sections. You got assault rifle sections, submachine gun sections, light machine gun sections, medium machine gun sections, light mortars, anti tank rifle sections, uh, anti-tank sections, tank hunter sections, flamethrowers, and then it goes into uh, armored fighting vehicle weapons and their guns, uh, and so on and so forth. Plenty of detail for any uh, World War II grognard here. Uh, let's see what else we got in this book. Now, at this point, I th there is an option for low ammo. If you roll bad enough, you can end up having your powerful guns, anyway, uh, being marked as low ammo, or even out of ammo. That's a fun little add to the game. I like that. Uh, at this point, I think we're going to talk about the actual mechanics of fire. Just real quick, basically, how uh, firing with your tanks and your infantry works. Basically, without getting into too much detail, as I said before, this is a simple system of you roll 2d6 and you're after a target number. 
Now, your role will be modified by various circumstances and the quality and training of your troops and the weapon systems involved. So there's some modifiers. And typically to hit, you need to score at least a six. Now, the better you roll, the more effective your shot will be. And see, what you do is that once you acquire a hit, which again is six plus, you take that result, the final result of the modified die roll, and you consult a table, which basically is a the type of morale check your target will have to take. Now, it doesn't matter if the target is a tank or if it's infantry or whatever. It still takes an effect that's basically a check on a morale table. And he'll make a roll on that to see what actually happens. It could be they break and they're removed from the table. They could be suppressed and they can't shoot in the next turn. Or they can't move except to pull back. Or it could be a, a lot of different results. In the case of vehicles, uh, they could also be damaged through this roll. Uh, in which case they'll be penalized when they try and shoot because they're marked as damaged. Uh, normally a tank is taken out of the game and considered destroyed when it takes two damage. Uh, hits, uh, results. Uh, that's basically how the shooting system and mechanics work, and it's kind of similar with close assault as well, in close combat. Uh, there is some differences though, uh, like for instance when you're shooting anti-tank weapons, like say I'm using a bazooka against a tank, or say a Sherman is firing on a Panzer IV, you know, anti-tank fire. Uh, you basically roll your 2d6, modify it, and so on, just as normal. However, there's one additional step before you go to that results table, which causes a morale check on the target. And what it is, with, uh, is you, with your result, after it's modified, add the armor penetration of your weapon. Like, for instance, maybe it's 4, maybe it's 5. You add that to your result. Now, deduct from that the armor of the target. Like, say it's it's... It's the front armor of a Sherman, which is four. You deduct four from that total. Uh, the higher, the better. The more likely you are to take that enemy tank out or force you know, harsh results on it when it makes its test. Uh, that's how that works. So there's an additional step there where you take into account the armor penetration of the weapon system that hit and the armor of the target based on the side that's hit. For instance, it could be its side armor or it could be its front that's how that works. Uh, Off-board artillery and on-board artillery as well. This game system caters to both. So if you have lots of artillery models from Flames of War, you can use them. Put them on the table and they work the same similar way. Uh, with that, it's basically you observe a target, usually with an observer or a command headquarters uh, section. Spot a target. You roll for availability of the artillery. Uh, if the batteries, guns are available. Uh, if they are, you roll again uh, to see how accurate your shot is, which can result in anything from, oh, it's a complete miss and does nothing, it deviates and hits your own troops, or it's spot on and just does a devastating fire for effect. Uh, once it is got targets under it, you take the template and you check it out. If there's any targets under it, you're going to roll again on the fire for effect. And this is basically where you take into account a 2d6 roll, you add modifiers for the <clears throat> gun factor, and it, it'll basically cause any units under the template to take those little morale checks that we talked about before, which can, re again, result in them being broken or destroyed or... Uh, suppressed and so on and so forth. So that's how artillery works as well. So you can see it's it's kind of a similar mechanic where you're after that target number to hit, you roll 2d6, modify it, uh, and then the higher the result, the better you will be when you check for the actual effect that the target makes a roll for, uh, typically a morale check. Uh, and that's basically how it works. And like I said, it's it's similar with close assaults. So yeah, that's the basic mechanics of combat. Uh, chapter 17 talks about smoke screens. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, so we do have smoke uh, covered in these rules, as well as air attacks, which uh, are very abstracted. They're basically, they come onto the table and same similar results as off-board artillery. So you can have these playing a role in your battles as well, if you've got lots of airplanes. And then chapter 19 goes into the exploit phase. Uh, and so on and so forth. And that's about it. There's the rallying phase, how it works, explanation of the breakpoint in chapter 21. 
Uh, and here's something nice. We've got scenarios. The book does include, I believe, about three scenarios. Uh, they got a nice map here. This one's called St. Nicholas's Farm. And you got your little orders of battle, the forces, the missions, the breakpoints, and so on. Any special rules like artillery that might be in, available to both sides. And yeah, there you go. That's scenario one. Scenario two, uh, similar. You got German and U.S. forces going at it. Nice little map. And finally, a Stalingrad. Uh, scenario 1942 same little situation so you do get scenarios with this game uh, and here in chapter 23 it talks about optional rules and this game is, game is great for adding your own optional rules as well but everything from dummy positions like tanks with fake barrels and things like that uh, representing early war Russian commissars uh, let's see there's a rule that allows suppressed sections. Now remember, if a unit could be suppressed, it really can't do anything except fall back. You have to rally it to get it to do something. But here's an option that allows the unit that's suppressed to actually defensive fire if it's close assaulted. Uh, so that gives them a little bit of protection for themselves. Uh, Russian open and opening bombardments. Special rules for artillery for the British and U.S. Uh, naval gunfire support. That's nice. Uh, River crossings, boats, demolition charges. Now, here's a section here, chapter 24, that I really appreciate with any set of rules, and it's designer notes. This is something I really look for in any set of rules. It's, it's when, a, when an author of a set of rules puts designer notes in his rules, it really helps you to understand some of the ideas behind the rules. And I should add that throughout this rule book, there are sections where the author takes the time to actually explain uh, the reasoning behind some of the rules. Like for instance here, uh, the spotting rationale. Uh, here's the author's notes regarding spotting in the rules. And it's a extensive little section, which gives you a reason why he is doing the rules the way he's doing them. This kind of stuff I really enjoy and appreciate from an author in a set of rules. So kudos for that. That's a nice touch. And finally, after the designer notes, we get into setting up a game. This is all about points. Uh, if you want to use a point system in Army List, you can do that. It's a very simple point system, not complex. Uh, basically, your your unit types have a basic point value, and that's it. Sometimes there's a modifier, like for troop grading. Uh, and that's about it. And it gives you suggestions for the size of battles and how many points to apply and the table size for each one. As well as some notes here to represent attackers and defenders, like uh, if one side is the defender, he should have like 25% less troops and so on and so forth. Little things like that. So here you are. Perfect little section. Then it's got point costs for your basic unit types. This first section of the army lists. Uh, basically basic types of units that are typical. Uh, in this case for German infantry, uh, it gives you uh, the options that you can take for each thing. Here we got infantry platoon, regulars. Gives you their point value, 95 points. And it tells you what it's made up of. Down here you can add various things like support weapons and things to it. So. You can build your armies based on these alone. Uh, and then it does the same thing with the British. As you can see, the Russians. It's got the United States, of course. And those are the main forces involved there. Uh, then it goes into the equipment tables, talks about the different vehicles, and, uh, pack 40s, and all this stuff, all their stats in the game. Uh, like, for instance, we got a Tiger 1. Its gun type is 88 millimeter. Uh, its armor is rated as B, its speed is S, which stands for small. Uh, hmm, that's not right. Uh, can't remember what that stands for. Is that slow? That's what it is. Sorry. S is for slow. M is for uh, medium speed. Uh, let's see what else we have here for this. We have the year it was brought in, which is 42, and its cost, 200 points. That's a pretty pricey tank, as you'd expect. British, Russians, United States. Then it's got equipment for the Poland, France, Italy, and Japan. Little tag on at the back. Now here, we've got an even more useful section. Now this is close to the end of the book, and this is your tables of organization, 44 to 45. 
this actually gives you orders of battle, the basic orders of battle, and the notes for each one are extremely useful. Uh, for example, the German battalion sized formations. You got grenadier battalions, fusilier battalions, motorized panzer grenadier battalions, Volksgrenadier battalions, Fallschirmjäger battalions. Uh, it basically tells you how they're organized, how many companies, what, how, what was in each company, what the support units were, and so on and so forth. And plenty of notes which add historical elements to the organization here. Uh, like it might mention specific divisions. Uh, like for instance here it mentions uh, the 21st Panzer Division in Normandy had two armored Panzer Grenadier battalions, but the majority only had a single armored Panzer Grenadier battalion. Little notes like this. Uh, so these are basically uh, for you to make your own scenarios and your own army lists. Uh, and there are some suggestions if you want to use this. I believe it says, for instance, uh, pick a battalion and you have to take at least two companies from this battalion. And a third company can be taken from any other battalion on your side. I think that's the basics if you want to use a point system with these uh, tables of organization. I believe that's described right here. And that's basically how that works. And it covers the, all these German forces. It goes into the British, of course, you got parachute, battalions, quite a few British. And then it goes into the Soviets, the Russians, obviously they're in the red. Then the U.S. battle groups or battalions, same kind of thing. And that's it. So there you go, folks. That is the book in a nutshell. So there you go, folks. That's Panzer Grenadier uh, Deluxe. Uh, as far as what I think about it, my final thoughts, whether or not you should uh, make the expense on buying this set of rules and by the way, this set of rules is available. Uh, you can get it here in the United States from on military matters. Uh, I believe it's uh, anywhere from fifty to sixty dollars. It's kind of steep in price. You are getting a high quality product here, though, like I pointed out earlier. Uh, but as far as the actual gameplay of the game and what I think about it, uh, I definitely think there's a learning curve to it, especially if you've never played World War II games before. Uh, the only downside to this game, though. Now, I, I have to say that this is a set of rules that's not difficult to play. It's very easy and fast moving. Uh, but when it comes to learning the game, uh, especially if you're new to World War II gaming, uh, there is a lot of page flipping. And I think one of the reasons for that is that a lot of the subjects are broken up into multiple chapters. Like, for instance, shooting might be broken up into several chapters. Um, whatever the topic is, and there's a lot of page flipping back and forth to get to the relevant information. Uh, that's probably the only issue I had when I was first learning this game. Uh, it's not a difficult to play game though. Once you've had about six, seven, eight turns in the game, it goes really quick and you catch on real quick. Uh, I think it's mainly geared for historical players uh, interested in recreating historical battles. Uh, it's not a set of rules for tournament players. Uh, and as a result, it's, it, it, it's, there's a lot of open to interpretation rules in this uh, rule book, uh, which is not a bad thing. That's actually good, particularly if you're of the historical bent, because you can, you know, interpret things the way you want, change things the way you want, and add things the way you want, which is basically my style of play, actually. I, I appreciate that with a set of rules. I like to tinker. I like to put my stint on things if I don't think the rules cover it well. Uh, but yeah, I think overall it's a fast moving game, uh, not difficult to play, a little bit of a learning curve if you've never played World War II games before, especially uh, if you're an experienced war gamer, it's really easy to learn because you can make up your own things and you kind of know. I think the author uh, makes a few assumptions that you have some knowledge of uh, war gaming when you play this. It's not bad at all, uh, and I do recommend this set of rules if you enjoy the historical side of gaming. Uh, it's fun. It's definitely fun. Uh, I enjoyed the games I had. There were some very nail-biting moments in the games that I have played. Uh, I enjoy quite a few elements of the game. I really appreciate 
the command and control aspects of this game. And I think that's probably the biggest highlight of this set of rules is the command and control rules, the use of impetus and headquarters impetus, uh, trying to get your units to do things. Uh, because you're never certain. You can have all these units on the table, but unlike other games, you can't just assume that you're going to be able to do anything with those units. You have to make that die roll to activate them and then decide what you're going to do with them. And in some cases, you're going to have to have impetus uh, to spend to get those guys to do what you want them to do, uh, to basically activate. And I enjoy that aspect of the game uh, immensely. The combat rules, the shooting, the off-board artillery, and on-board artillery, it's all pretty standard, nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. Uh, like I said, it's, it's part of the General the Brigade family, so there's elements to this set of rules that are familiar if you've played any of those other games, like rolling double sixes, uh, and also double ones in this game. All kinds of interesting things can happen. Tanks can run out of ammo or whatever, you know, all kinds of fun things. And that makes it quite enjoyable, too. Uh, I do recommend the set of rules. Uh, you can get this United States uh, from On Military Matters. And I believe it goes from anywhere from 50 to $60. So it is kind of pricey, but I think it's worthwhile. So definitely recommend to anyone with an interest in the historical side of World War II gaming. Uh, if you're a tournament player, this might not be for you. Uh, if you like a lot of granular detail in your games, uh, this set of rules might not be for you either. It goes into detail, but not immensely. I know there's other rules out there that do that. Uh, this does not, but it gives you just enough detail to have a really good, fun, tactical feeling game uh, of World War II. So there you go, folks. I do recommend this set of rules, and I hope you enjoyed this little review. It was kind of long, but... It, I tried to cover as much as I could. If you have any questions about this set of rules, leave me a comment, uh, like, uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, let me know what you think, and if you have any more ideas about what you'd like to see me review, uh, please feel free to comment and let me know, because that's, that's why I'm doing these videos. So there you go, folks. Panzer Grenadier Deluxe. It's a pretty good set of rules, and I do recommend it. Take care.